morning again, everyone. We are in our final week of this sermon series that we've called Next, in which we've been in the book of Deuteronomy, which is this super long sermon that Moses preaches to the people of Israel right before they're about to move into a new thing that God has for them. He's led them out of slavery into Egypt. Uh, out of slavery in Egypt, into the wilderness. They've wandered around the wilderness, and they're right on the frontier, looking into the thing that God had promised them. And Moses gives them this rather long restatement of what God has already said, but how they're going to live it out in a new and different kind of context. No longer in the wilderness, now in the promised land. And we've seen a lot of parallels uh, in this ancient document with our current situation. We noticed how when a couple years ago as we went through a season of discernment we felt like God was calling us to do some old things in new ways and the way we articulated it was to say that we believe God was calling us to be transformed by Jesus so that we can make an impact in our among our neighbors and our networks that's not something that is a whole new thing this is something that people who are following Jesus have always been called to do but we've sense that God has been calling us to do it in more intentional and in more practical ways. So in this sermon series, we've seen some parallels, and we've examined how the situation of the people of Israel at that time uh, has something to say to us in our situation in this time, because we're always, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, we're always on the verge of something new. And we're always trying to figure out what is it that God is calling us to do. How do we live what God has already said and done, what has already said and uh, done? How do we live and respond to that in a new and different situation? And so maybe this um, ancient sermon has been surprisingly helpful in, uh, in helping us situate ourselves in that way. We've had, over the course of this series, we've been asking some intentional questions of ourselves and of our community. We've asked Uh, How are you spending time with Jesus? How are you connecting with others? How are you blessing your neighbors? These are things that are crucial to what it is to be the people of God, but we're asking how do we do this more effectively, more intentionally? And so this morning we're going to finish up this series. Um, Oh, there's one other thing that we did, which I almost forgot to mention, which is last week we invited you to do an intentional prayerful, reflective walk around your community, a guided way of thinking about where are we, where has God placed us, and what's already there, what's God already doing. And so if you didn't do that or missed last week, there's some of those, uh, there's uh, that exercise is still out at Connection Central, you can grab one on your way out. We'd love to hear about that experience. If you did it and want to tell us about what it was like, shoot an email to one of the pastors or grab a staff member and let them know. We have been trying to walk with the people of God as they are looking towards something new, as we have been looking towards something new as well. So we're going to jump this morning to the end of the sermon, chapter 30. It might sound like a dream come true for you. Don't you wish you could just always jump to the end of the sermon? Like a British royal during a wedding sermon? Did any of you see their faces? That was amazing. There was this incredible sermon, and they just could not deal. They did not know what was going on. (laughs) Moses comes to the end of his sermon, and he's at the application point. This is the moment where he is calling the people to commitment, to recommitment to the purposes and plans and future that God has for them. And so let's take a look. It's in Deuteronomy 30. We're going to begin in verse 11. It's on page 188. So while we're turning there, let's also turn to... God's Spirit. Ask for help in understanding what we're about to read. Spirit of God, we pray that you would fill us, fill this room in a, in a special way now as we open up your word. Help us to understand what we read in a new way so that we might hear your voice in a new way. For the sake and glory of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Moses says this, beginning in verse 11. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and to proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. 
It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so here's the deal about camping. I know I was raised in Colorado, as many of you know. So I know I'm supposed to be someone who likes camping. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I shouldn't like camping. I kind of feel like this is a, a failure of my own development as a person. But I really don't like camping. And I don't like camping for a few reasons. Mostly because it just feels so complicated. It feels like you have to take like three days of preparing for every 30 minutes of camping. <laughs> you have to like go to the store and buy all this strange food, and you have to figure out how you're going to pack it, and you've got to decide where you're going to go, and then you've got to get all the gear, and then you're going to go there, and you drive, and then you get there, and if you're me, it's, a, it's definitely raining, so you have to like quickly put the tent up, and it just it feels so complicated. I don't even, I don't even own a sleeping bag. <laughs> so it's very complicated for me. I know that I should like camping. I, I, I like the outdoors. I like um, the starry sky. I like campfires. I like all the stuff like, about camping. I want to want to camp. <laughs> but it's just so complicated that I, I can't even bring myself to start. Please don't invite me to go camping <laughs> as a result of this. Camping feels that way to me. It feels like it's so complicated that it's hard to even know how to begin. But there's lots of other parts of life that are like that, too. And maybe for you, it's like exercising or dieting or setting a budget or planning a vacation. There's just lots of things that just feel overwhelming and complicated. And so we don't even get started. And maybe the spiritual life is like that for you, where you feel like you don't even know to begin. What Bible translation am I supposed to read? How am I supposed to understand what I'm reading? Uh, how am I supposed to pray? How do I know if I'm doing it right? How, am I, how do I know what God wants me to do? And what do I do when I can't do that? We, we tend to think that the spiritual life is this, is this really exotic and difficult task that's, that's really far away. This is difficult attainment, which is why I love what Moses says here. Because to a people who sometimes feel like following after God is so complicated that we don't even know where to begin, Moses begins by saying, look, this thing I'm asking you to do, this life following God, this spiritual life, it's actually simple. This is doable. In the beginning of the passage, verses 11 through 14 that we read, he says this, Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you. It's not way up in heaven so that someone has to go and grab it and bring it down. It's not across the sea so that someone has to travel really far to figure this out. No, the word that you are to obey, it's right in front of you. It's within you. I've given it to you. God has come down to give you this message. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't make it more difficult than it has to be. Because if you're like me and camping, if you overcomplicate it, you won't even start. So often we think the spiritual life is for these spiritually gigantic people who somehow are always serenely aware of what God wants them to do. They have it all together. They don't have any doubts. They, they aren't struggling with anything. They know how to pray. They know everything about the Bible. They know exactly what they're supposed to do. Those are the people that God 
wants to follow him is what we often think. And we know, each of us know, that we're not that kind of person. But one thing that's clear throughout the pages of Scripture is that that is not who God calls to follow after him. I mean, look at, look at the Israelites. They literally needed God to explain to them how to go to the bathroom. Check out Deuteronomy 23. We didn't preach on this one, but... It says, designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. That's good advice. <laughs> Especially if you're camping. It also complicates the uh, title of the education series that we have going uh, in the courtyard called Digging in Deuteronomy. <laughs> this is a personal life goal that I've accomplished just now. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have it all together, right? They need instructions on the basic things in life. These are the people that God has still called out of slavery, still called into the wilderness, and still called into the promised land so that they, these everyday normal people, can be the people that reveal and exhibit God's majesty, his glory, his character to the whole world. That's their job, and this is who they are. So this, what God is calling us to, what God is calling people to when he calls us to follow him it's not complicated. Don't let it seem too complicated or you won't even begin. Now, the reason that the spiritual life is doable is not because of anything in us. It's because that God makes it doable for us. The passage uh, in verse 14 says, No, the word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. God has communicated what he wants. You don't have to figure it out. He's making it He's making it plain, and he's given it to you. So it's not far away. Let's not pretend like this is some extremely complicated situation. God has told us, God has called us, and it's right in front of us. This, of course, doesn't mean it's easy. The, 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 the task of following God is not something that we have the strength to do. One of my favorite prayers comes from um, a man named Augustine who was an Algerian Christian lived in what today is Algeria in the, around the year like 400, and he had this very short prayer that went like this. He was pray, he'd pray to God, and he'd say, command what you will. Command whatever you, tell me whatever you want me to do. Send me wherever you want me to go. Call me to whatever you want me to call me, to, to call me to. Command what you will, and then he says, and give what you command. Command what you will, but you got to give me what you command. God can call us to all kinds of things, but the grace of God is that he also gives what he commands. On this side of Jesus, when we read the word is near you, it's in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it, on this side of Jesus, we remember that that word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, that God came to be with us in Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus rose, he poured out his spirit. He gives his spirit to everyone who trusts him to enable them to do what he commands. So it's not up to us. Something to remember today, it's Pentecost. It's a day when the church remembers the importance and power of the Holy Spirit. And so we're remembering that the Holy Spirit comes upon us to enable us to do the things that God is calling us to do. So it's not, it's not up to us. But it's also not complicated. So now that I have your attention by my clever juxtaposition of poop jokes and St. Augustine quotes, the next thing that Moses says is, though the spiritual life is simple, it's also serious. He says in verse 15, See, I set before you today, on the one hand, life and prosperity, and on the other, death and destruction. This is, these are the options. 
life and prosperity, and death and destruction. He wants to lay as clearly as possible what the stakes are for the people. And so often, just like us, they in their time probably wanted to just have a little section of life that was called the spirituality part of life. They wanted to kind of have all these categories of life, and God was involved in some of them, or maybe sprinkled in throughout, you know, career, relationships, hobbies, whatever. And then there's a little spiritual part of life, like, like, like our spiritual lives are the, are the, is the vegetables of our diet of life. Nobody really likes it, but you got to have it to be healthy. Moses is, is putting before us an entirely different approach, where it's not just the life following God is not just one little part of our lives, but it's actually the whole thing. It's either following after God into life or turning away from God towards destruction. Those are the options that he lays out. And so we're invited to remember the huge sweep, the huge implications of what we're called to in this simple call to follow. I mean, just think about it for a second. If there is a God who created everything that you can see in a microscope and everything that you can see in a telescope, and that God wants to tell you how life should work, and that God cares about your whole life, then then he has something to say about every little corner of our lives. And if that God wants to be in relationship with us, then that's something that we should be paying attention to. And if that God comes to earth and becomes a human being in order to bring us into relationship with himself, then that's something we want to pay attention to. And if he goes all the way to death in order to be in relationship with us, then we know that he is serious about that. He's willing to go to destruction so that we can have life. That's something that changes everything. And if, as Andy Stanley says, if a man can predict his own death and resurrection and then pull it off, you should just go with whatever that guy says. (laughs) So we're called to a very serious call. It's simple but it's serious. Love the Lord your God. Walk in obedience to him. Keep his commands. And in this way, you will live and increase. This is the way to life. So we've heard that the spiritual life is simple. We've heard that it's serious. Next, Moses moves into this section where he wants to call the people to make a decision, to make a choice about what they've heard. He calls them in in a way where he is saying, look at what God has done. Look Look at what God has already done. He's brought you out of slavery. He's led you through the wilderness. There was a fire and a cloud that you were following. These are people who have already been following after God. But in this moment, he's inviting them to make a choice. And for all of us, at some point or another, we have to make a decision about, what, about whether we are going to follow God or not. And oftentimes we think of it as a one-time decision. To be sure, there is a first time that we need to make that decision. But the life following after God is, is much more a, a series of ongoing decisions to commit and recommit to the purpose of God in our lives over and over again. And so Moses says to the people, this day, to people who have been following God for decades, this day I'm calling heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. So now choose life. For the Lord is your life. To follow after God is to follow after life. And this is not a decision that can just be made once and then set aside. This is a whole new rhythm of life that we begin to move into. If God 
has set us free, acted to set us free. And that same God who created everything has showed us how to live. And as we've been singing, if that God is in control and guiding us where we go, then the proper response is to make an intentional and conscious decision to follow after him. You know how you know when you've actually decided to do something? Like when you've decided to go camping? You've actually taken a step. You've done something. You haven't just, you're not just thinking about how it would be nice to get away for a while or how, how it might be nice to get out into the wilderness and do a little camping. You know you're actually about to, to go camping when you go to the store and buy all that awful food you're going to eat. Or when you've booked the campsite, when you've begun, when you've taken a step towards that, that's how you know that you're moving in that direction. You haven't, gone, you haven't taken a step towards going on a vacation to Disneyland until you've booked something, until you've taken a step. Before that, you're just thinking about it. You're just considering it. And so Moses is saying to the people, right now, I want you to choose. Choose who you're going to follow. Are you going to follow after the true God who leads you into life? Are you going to follow your own intuitions, which is going to lead you towards false gods that are going to lead you to your own destruction? Now choose life. Because the Lord is your life. This is a, sometimes a, a complicated thing because it feels complicated because we're not really sure how to do that first step, how to take that first tangible step. And so I want to invite you to consider one way that Christians throughout the centuries have, have done this, have, have committed themselves to God's purpose. There's a, an ancient practice that lots of people who were, uh, throughout the centuries that were in sort of monks, nuns who were in monasteries, who devoted their whole lives to God, that to help them, they would create these things called, called rules, rules of life. And so there's like the Order of St. Benedict has a, a rule that helps organize how their life together works. And this, this community, um, they would, th this, this has happened across communities, not just, you know, uh, not just monks have done this, but lots of people have found that having a way of thinking about life comprehensively, holistically, and intentionally uh, enables us to begin to make some decisions about how we're going to follow God practically. And so this kind of, this kind of activity can help us as we think about following God simply, but seriously, and intentionally. Because that is the third dimension of life following God. We don't accidentally slide into a vital, flourishing spiritual life with God. God is the one who enables that, but our response is to make some decisions in that same direction. So the spiritual life is simple. The spiritual life is serious. The spiritual life is intentional. And one way... To, to pursue that simply, spiritual, uh, simply, seriously, and intentionally is by creating a kind of rhythm of life of our own. And so, here's how this works. We have an example here that is a, a way of organizing life simply, seriously, and intentionally. As you can see, there's... There's five categories that cover different dimensions of our lives. We have our life with God, our life with ourselves, our lives with others, our lives with our finances, and our lives for others. And I want to take a second to just explain what we mean by each of those. Because, of course, all of life, every aspect here, has to do with our life with God. But when we put life with God, what I mean by that is that part of your life where you are in personal relationship with God, your spiritual practices, your time with God, the way that you answer the question, how are you spending time with Jesus? That's what that dimension of life, that's what we mean by our life with God. Then we have our life with ourselves, by which I mean the part of our lives where we recognize that we are limited, created beings with bodies, hearts, minds, and souls. This is our our physical health, our emotional health. 
This is our intellectual life, our curiosities, our pursuits. That's that part of life. Our life with others is our life with our closest key relationships, with your family, with your closest friends, with your coworkers, the people that God has set you among. And the question that we're asking here is, how are you connecting with others? What are you doing tangibly, simply, seriously to cultivate these key relationships? We have our life with finance. A lot of times we think about this as being some other section that's cordoned off from the rest of our lives, but as we all know, that our, our life, what we do with our money tells us what we value. So this is a really helpful way to think about our spiritual lives. What are we what are we investing in, literally? What are we spending our energies towards? And how do we organize our lives so that we can live more intentionally and generously and freely? And then lastly, our lives for others. Sometimes in our spiritual lives, we think that it's all about kind of our own sense of well-being and spiritual equilibrium. But I incredibly crucial part of our life with God is our lives for others. What are we intentionally, seriously, and simply doing to bless others? How are you blessing your neighbors? That's the question that we're answering here. How are you pouring into somebody else? How are you taking what you have learned and sharing it with others? How are you tangibly working to make someone else's life a little bit easier? All of these are woven together in our own personal lives, but it's helpful to kind of separate them out because then that helps us to make some actual decisions about how and what we want to be about in these areas of life. And because the life of following God is not just a one-time decision, but a series of ongoing decisions, we've broken this up into daily and weekly and yearly rhythms. So the idea here is that you take some time and think about each area of your life and rhythm the, and the rhythm of your life and then ask, what do, I wanna, what do I want to do that would help me be in these areas, to live intentionally and practically in the way that I want to? Who, what is God calling me to do in each area of life so that I can create in my own life a kind of spiritual rhythm that will lead me to life, to the Lord who is life. In our um, life together as a church, we've been thinking a lot about what's next for Central and what is God calling us to, but the truth is, the simple, serious truth is that all that Central is, is a bunch of us's. I mean, we're, we're Central, and so where Central is going to be going is where we are going individually in our own lives. Yes, we're trying to dream about new and creative and effective ways to connect with our neighbors and networks and to build more authentic community, but that only works as each of us recommit to the God that we have been following or commit for the first time in a tangible, practical way to following after God. And this is a tool that can help us do it. So the idea is you just write in these boxes a rhythm that you would like to be about, a practice, some, some kind of action or activity or habit that you'd like to build in order to live the life that God is calling you to. So here's like an example of how it could look. You just look at that for a second. These are just, these, this isn't mine, these are just some ideas of ways that you can build a comprehensive, holistic kind of rhythm to your whole life so that everything that you are and everything that you're about is leading you toward the Lord who is life. The beauty of this is that yours doesn't have to look anything like this. Yours could look entirely different. In fact, in the life following Jesus, there is no one-size-fits-all path to discipleship. Following after him is something we do together, but it's something we do individually, and he's calling each of us to a different, a different rhythm. And so you could, I think, find this helpful if this is the first time you've ever walked into this church. I bet you could imagine some of these boxes probably pop right into your mind of something you'd like to build into your life 
in order to live the life that you want to live. And if you've been following Jesus for a long, long time, so much so that you're thinking about becoming a monk, well, you might want to get used to doing something like this because this is how this is how life is structured. So this is something that can help us wherever we are in our life following Jesus. And I, and I think that we um, are invited to embrace a new rhythm at certain moments of life, certain moments along our path, we're invited as Moses invites the people who have been following God for a long, long time before they're entering into what's next. He calls them to a new and different and deeper kind of commitment a simple commitment, a serious commitment, and an intentional commitment to practically live in ways that lead to life, the Lord who is our life. So this is a tool. This is just something that's supposed to help. It's not supposed to be a burden. It's not supposed to become a spiritual to-do list or necessarily just a goal-setting chart for us. It's inviting us to think about all of our life, how it fits together, and how we can build in rhythms that lead us to life. And so the, the, the way I, I think that this is, this is captured really well by Eugene Peterson in his translation of the Bible and the message, he has this wonderful passage where Jesus invites people to follow him, and it sounds like this. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. This is the Lord who is our life, who is inviting us. And he says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. And what that rest looks like is actually some activity. <laughs> Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He promises not to lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon us, but says, keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. You see, the call to follow Jesus, it, this simple serious call that invites us to decide and make some decisions and choose how we're going to follow him. This is actually an invitation to life as it should be. So often we just get swept along by the current and we're not thinking intentionally or purposefully about anything that's going on in our lives. And then we wonder why we feel scattered and out of control and unfulfilled. And so I want to invite you, actually, this morning, as Moses did, to make some decisions about how you are going to simply and seriously follow the Lord who has set us free and who's calling us into the next thing, calling us into life. And so I want to invite up Liam to um, help guide us into a time where we're going to actually do this. There's copies of the Rhythm of Life in the side aisles here, and I want to invite you to take some time over the next few minutes and really invite God into this. Um, we're going to sing, and we're going to stand, and if you'd like to go and grab one, I encourage you to do so. You can return to your seat and begin to build this rhythm. Make some decisions this morning before you leave about what it would look like to live according to the unforced rhythms of grace. And you can just write that down. You don't have to fill it all out this morning. If you need help, there's a whole bunch of ideas on the concourse windows outside. There are people who can help you. You can talk to your small group. You can talk to a mentor about it in the days to come. We're going to have a couple workshops on June 10th and 17th at 9 o'clock to help you develop this in a tangible way. But this morning, as we've heard Moses call the people to a new and deeper kind of commitment, a simple and serious commitment to follow after God, I want to invite you to the same. So let's stand and let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for setting us free. Thank you for calling us forward. And thank you for the opportunity by your grace again and again to make decisions that will lead us to life. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit this morning in a new way that we might have the imaginations 
to uncover and discern and choose that rhythm of life that will lead to life. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.